Okay, so uh, it is um, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so welcome uh, everyone to uh, Drisha. This is the third and uh, final class in this series on Shemitah, Radical Perspectives on Society, Land, and the Individual with Ravanit Gila Rosen. We encourage uh, everyone to turn on your video if you're able to, um, just so we uh, can feel like we're studying together in a chavruta in a class, just like we did uh, pre-pandemic when we were uh, in person. We would really, really, really love to see your faces whenever possible. Um, so please do that right now if you're able. Um, and then uh, feel free to uh, ask questions or uh, comment uh, uh, during uh, today's class uh, here in the chat box on Zoom if you're with us or as a comment uh, if you're watching us live on Facebook. I want to also say hello uh, to anyone watching us uh, live on the uh, website. And with uh, that, uh, I'll turn this uh, to you, uh, Rabanit Gila. Hi, so thank you so, so much. It really has been a pleasure working with you and with Kat Kayla. It's really been just so lovely. Um, so uh, we were looking over the last two weeks at uh, some of the, um, radical ideas that come out of the halachot, of the laws of Shemitah. Um, so we were looking at the, at the sense of private property, of ownership, and uh, the sense of ownership that's generally accepted uh, today um, in society, pretty much most parts of the world, I think, even the parts that call themselves more communist, and which actually also appears in halacha, gets sort of eroded and undermined uh, by the laws of Shemitah. Uh, loans, we saw a couple of weeks ago, are seen as um, not something clear cut with a, with a star, you know, a document and it's clearly yours that you have to mine, that you have to give back to me or yours that I have to give back to you, but they're part of the fluidity and the organic nature of the world. And uh, the letting go of the land uh, both of working it and of its produce is an acknowledgement of God's creation of the world and his continued ownership of nature and his presence in the world. In fact, our letting go is what makes space uh, for his presence. Uh, now today I would like to relate to two aspects of the Jubilee of Yovel. I don't know if you still have uh, the page that was all Hebrew from the first a week, which was just places in the in the Torah that mention it, but otherwise, if you have a chumash, uh, it's in Pashat Bahar in Vayikra, uh, chapter twenty-five, and most of the verses will actually be I brought in the Hebrew and English at the end. But there are two laws here about uh, the jubilee year. Uh, first of all, they blow the shofar on the end of the on um, uh, Yom Kippur, and they tell everybody, they blow the shofar, and they sanctify uh, the uh, 50th year. And the first thing that it says is, you will call out freedom to all its inhabitants. I want to point out this wasn't written 100 or 200 years ago or last week. This is a text from thousands of years ago, yes? Yes. And we have this combination of an acknowledgement that the land is God's. You are just sojourners with me. You are people who have settled on it. All of you, not just the poor person who needs to come back to this land. All of you are just sort of on this land, which is God's. And in the Jubilee year, you acknowledge that in two ways. One is that slaves who wanted to stay slaves go free. And there's a Jewish slave who after six years could go free and decided to stay, must go free. And that people return to their ancestral land. So somebody who sold his land goes, comes back to it. So the slave who goes free is not in a horrific situation. He can go back to his, his land. Now, this sounds very beautiful and it is indeed very beautiful. But uh, I would like to point out that it also is a tremendous um, recipe for upheaval. Yes, it's total social upheaval. You had a slave, and tomorrow what's going to be with this slave? He actually is going to own a piece of property next door to you, twice the size of yours. I mean, that could happen. Yes, so tremendous 
tremendous, tremendous social upheaval, right? Um, prescribed social upheaval. Everything you, you were used to, this person was a slave for heaven's sake. He wasn't your equal. And suddenly he might be actually out there, you know, and, and make a good, good job of it with his land that he's gotten back. So um, now in actual fact, uh, the laws of the uh, Yovel, as we saw two weeks ago, only really apply during the first temple period, because once the Jews returned to Israel, after uh, being in Babylon for 70 years, they didn't return to their ancestral lands. And so ju the Jubilee year no longer had biblical connotation. And also the majority of the people were not living in Israel. Um, and also slavery stops being a major issue among the Jewish people before others actually, although it then returned to be an issue of course in modern times. Um, so, it doesn't get kept. We don't know how much it was kept during the first temple period. We really don't know. But it certainly doesn't get kept in the same kind of way today. Yes. Um, and the question is, to what extent do the principles that it embodies underlie any aspects of the way um, Jewish law later developed? In other words, since Yovel's not there anymore. Right. The question is, well, we have this beautiful I Jubilee year and and we have the idea of people taking a sabbatical. We have all kinds of nice ideas, but I'm asking more in, more endemically, is it part of Jewish law? And I would like to suggest that the, we see the echoes of this kind of acknowledgement that um, really, in theory, we should allow for social upheaval. We don't actually have social, but we must allow. We must allow for real change. And we must be aware of the potential in people for real change and see to what extent our society can make that possible. Ourselves and our society can, can allow for flexibility that allows uh, for real change. So I want to look today, I want to start with some of the laws of tzedakah um, as they relate to one's residence and one's status. Um, and, um, and, and to questions of what the community owes the people within it. So I want to start with some laws in Pe'a. Pe'a is about the corner of the field. And in the Mishnah, the laws about staka appear, the more general laws about staka appear in the tractates, which are about the agrarian laws of staka that are already in the Bible such as pe'ah, leaving a corner of your field. Now, pe'ah is a very interesting mitzvah. It's like taking tax before you ever get the money home. You have to leave a corner of your field for poor to come and take from it. And you cannot decide which poor person gets it, right? In other words, it's not really yours to give away. It's yours to acknowledge it's really God's. And how big a corner of the field should you, should you leave? Well, from the Torah, you could leave one sheep, for heaven's sake, and it would be. But Chazal said better a certain amount, but it would depend on how wealthy you are, how many poor people there are, etc. as to how big a corner you leave. And what you can do is you can't tell your best friend who happens to be poor or your cousin who happens to be poor or whoever it is and say, tomorrow I'm starting the harvest, come at eight, 7 a.m. and you'll get a chance to get the corner because you have to leave the corner when you finish work. So everybody can see you harvesting and come to get it. It's not even yours to decide which poor person you want to give it to. Now, some forms of stucca are yours. Very much so to decide which person. But Peah isn't. Peah is a little bit like Shemitah. It's acknowledging the land isn't really yours. Your field isn't really yours. And at the end of the Masechet of Peah, the Mishnah talks about various ways in which the society took upon itself to give tzedakah. Now that the society already in the time of the Mishnah is not fully agrarian, and there are lots of people living in towns and not having enough to eat, and they're not right next to a field that they can go and pick up stuff, okay? So if we look at the first source, it's from Mishnah Pea, and the English translation leaves what to be desired for the, first, for the beginning. 
but because it starts with a phrase that we don't have in English, ein pochatim la'ani, which means it's in the plural, but it means one does not, not the they, there's no they here. One, the people who are running the community must not give less than a loaf, which is actually a loaf about the size of a quart, with, made out of wheat about the size of a quart. That's what it comes to, although the, the way it describes it. But if you check up what these all these measurements mean, it means a loaf made from a quarter of a, a, a amount of, a, a, would fill about a quart, which is enough for two meals. So you can't give less than bread for two meals to the poor person who is traveling, who's moving from one place to the next. Why is he moving from one place to the next? Does he intend to stay maybe at your place if your food is too good? Maybe. We don't know if he's somebody who's like a peddler who has to go from place to place, or if he's a migrant looking for a place to stay. And we can remember... Today, when this is really an issue for us, how do we handle this issue? And I, I'm not suggesting that you can look it up in the Chumash or in Mishnah or Gemar and get an answer to all our questions today. You must get an approach. You can't get the exact answer, what should we do about the Mexican crisis or what should they do in Europe about, about the crisis of people coming across the Mediterranean. There won't be an exact answer, but there will be an approach. And we need to remember that um, in the English, the word sodomy is a certain type of misbehavior according to the way they to see what went on in Sodom. But in Hebrew, midat um, stom means something completely different. It means not helping others when you can, and it won't do any harm to you. Okay, so it's really, we saw this, it's very problematic. Now here, we start off, look at this, with the poor person who's moving from place to place. I think in the olden times, they didn't enjoy traveling as much as we do today. And it was the poor people who were moving from place to place and the people who were fine stayed home. But today, of course, a lot of us like traveling. Um, and if, if he just comes for, just turns up, so we have to give him enough for the two meals, this loaf of bread. If he's the one to sleep over, if he's going to stay over, spends the night, then nimlo panasat laila, what he needs for the night. Some people would say it's more about more food, like the soup. Some people say it's bedding and things, uh, absolutely just bedding and things like that, especially if it's cold, you need more bedding. And if Shabbat, if he stays over Shabbos, then we have to give him mazon shalosh sudot, food for three, the three meals of Shabbat. We don't say, well, he's a poor person. He doesn't usually eat so much. We don't have to give it to him. And we give him nicer food for Shabbat. And this is the poor person going from place to place for whom we have the least responsibility. Um, and then we get introduced to two forms of food charity. One's called the Tamchui and the other is the Kupa. What is the tamchui? The tamchui is what is sometimes today a soup kitchen or a charity. What does he got here? The charity bowl. Um, and, and the Ramam talks about how no community worth respecting itself can possibly exist without a tamchui and a kupa. It's like you can't live without it. There's, there's no way you could run a community of any self-respect without these forms of and it says that if you have enough food for two meals, you don't take from the tamchui. The tamchui is a basic food. People sometimes give money, sometimes they give food, cooked food into it. And somebody that's moving from town to town doesn't even have a way to cook the food. So we have to make sure they get actual food as against the kupa, which might be food or might be money. And somebody who has enough for two meals doesn't take from the tamchui. And if you have enough for 14 meals, which is the week, you don't take from the kupa. Okay. So um, we have these two types of stalker now. The tamchui, which is a soup kitchen, basically. It's immediate help, daily help for people who either have just turned up or who are so poor that they don't have a way to feed themselves on a daily basis. 
right? So we have a tamchui and we have a kupa, and people had to give to this. They were actually part of living in a, in a community meant that you had to um, give towards uh, these forms of tzedakah. Now, who did this go to? So, so we see a, a, a daily, something that's distributed daily, collected daily and distributed daily. And we see something um, that's distributed once a week for the week and who can get it. And I, I bring here the Tosefta from Gittin, which talks about Jews and non-Jews. Uh, a city which has in it Jews and, right, it's a nice translation, Gentiles, but that isn't what it says. It says pagans. And there is a difference because we're talking about even people who, we're not talking necessarily about, you know, m people who share culturally the seven mitzvot of Bnei Noach or anything like that. We're talking about even idolaters, yes? And we're living together in the same time. Aparnasim, those who oversee the communal fund, fund govin mi Yisrael ume of de kochbim. They ask for money from both. Mipnei darkei shalom. Um aparnasim aniye of de kochbim. Vis aniye Yisrael mipnei darkei shalom. They try and take money and give out the money to everyone. Okay, and there are a number of places in the Gemara where they mention that non-Jews knew, Gentiles knew, and we're talking about pagans in those times, that if they were poor, they could get from the Jewish saka, even when there was only a Jewish saka. They could get from the tamchui. So this is something for everybody. If we can, we collect it from everybody. But if not, we just collect it from between us and give it out. Right? Uh, and it goes on to say the other things we do because of the ways of peace. Yes? So if people are needy, we take care of them. And... Uh, we have these various ways. Now, this is to be found, as we saw, at the end of Mishnah Peah. But source number three, we suddenly, in the Talmud, nowhere near Masachet Peah. Where are we in source number three? We're in Baba Batra. Now, what are we doing in Baba Batra? Baba Batra, anybody know where Baba Batra is? Baba Batra is in Nezikin, in um, uh, uh, it's a tractate in the... In the part of this, of the Mishnah and Talmud, which talks about, well, Baba Kama talks about damages. Yes, my cat, my cat hurt your cat. I made a hole in the ground and you, somebody fell in. Um, does this teach us that there is a great responsibility for poor who live permanently in our, your community? You will see that there definitely is, absolutely, um, a greater responsibility to them. Uh, we will we will we will be coming to that. Um, so um, in the case of the poor who are moving from town to town, our responsibility is to make sure they have food while they're with us. And if they sleep over, bedding and something warm to sleep in. If they decide to stay with us, then we have much more responsibility, and we will see that. Okay? Now, um, the, these laws were in Peah, and suddenly I see that they're in, we're going to move to Baba Batra, which is all about people stealing. I mean, the, the, the Baba Bakama was about stealing and hurting people, and Baba Matia had things like, you know, finding lost objects and hiring laborers. And Baba Batra is about residence. It's about your community. It's about laws of inheritance of land. Um, and, and about how long I, I have to be living where to prove that it's my place, and it's about towns. And Tzedakah moves to there because there's no Bavli, there's no town with Bavli on Pea, as there isn't on certain whole sections. And so the laws of Tzedakah had to move somewhere. And I would have guessed they might move, I don't know, to Purim or Pesach or something like that, but they don't. They move into a tractate that's talking about how society is structured because they move into something that shows that this is part of the structured society. In a way, in the same way that in the Torah they were in, well, when you're harvesting and we're talking about the holidays in terms of the calendar, now we're going to remind you that there's also that was in the structure of time. And here it's more in the structure of society because people are living more in cities. And we have to say, when you structure a community in a city, what must be part of it? Oh, this tzedakah has to be part of it. So it's moved to there. 
And there they say, source number three, Tanu Rabbanam, Kupa Shel Tzedaka Nidbeit B'Shnaim, Mitchalek B'Shav. They quote the, um, the Mishnah there, which also said that the Kupa Tzedaka is collected by two and given out by three people. That was the end of source one, which I skipped. So the Kupa, the, the, um, when you collect the Kupa, the communal fund, you need to have two people go out to do it. And when you give it out, you need three people. And why do you need so many people? What a waste of voluntary labor, yes? And the answer is because um, it's collected by two people because people, we don't appoint one person to have authority. What does that mean? When they come to my house, they make an assessment of how much everybody should pay. And when they come to my house, I might not want to give them the money. If we have one person at the door telling me, this is what the community you have to pay, it might erupt a big fight. I might say, who are you to tell me how much I should pay? We can just imagine. If there are two delegates who are clearly the messengers of the community, we're hoping that there won't be altercations. So we always say two people. We also think that it's more respectful that a person who has to give that they're two people. Right? It's not something personal. So two people come to my door. Hopefully I'm the giver, but maybe I'm the recipient. I don't know. And they tell me that I need to give X amount. And there's a whole question, how much time I have, etc. Remember, this is for the kupa, the tamhui. I have to give them right away because they have to give it out that day. And three people have to give it out. Why do we need three people to give it out? Seems like a terrible waste of labor and also maybe embarrassing. Why? Because... If you go to court on a monetary case, you need three people, three judges, and people are going to be judging here how much to give out. Because how much to take was kind of decided before, but how much to give out is going to be decided when they see the situation. They might have thought this family didn't need so much and they get there and the real problems that they didn't know about. And they're going to have to, on the spur of the moment, change the amount the family's given. And therefore, we need to have like a little court going around and giving out the money. In the Jerusalem Talmud, the Talmud Yerushalmi says, no, really, we should have had 23. Like in, in cases of life and death. But we just can't do that. That's just not workable. So we're going to pretend this is a monetary case. But really deciding about stucker is like a capital case, because God forbid somebody could die because you make mistakes about how much stock to give, okay? So it's really very, very intense, this, this activity. Now, who's this for? So if you look at the second quote in number three, Tam Chui La Olam. Who asked the question? I, I didn't see who it was about who, do we have more responsibility for the, thank you, Evelyn. Tam Chui La Olam. The soup kitchen, the automatic meals every day, no matter what a person needs to eat, two decent meals, that's for the poor of the world. Anybody who turned up on my doorstep, we have to, we're obliged to give from the tamchui. Okay? And this is generally food that's ready to eat. It's a loaf of bread. It's cooked food. It's food ready to eat. Kupa la'aniye ha'ir. That's what somebody passing by can get. The kupa, which might include money for clothes, trying to get decent housing. That's for the aniye ha'ir, the people who have become a part of the town, which is not very hard to do. You just hang around and then you part of the town, right? When's your aniyehaya? But many people don't want to be aniyehaya. They're, they're, they're peddlers moving from place to place. But they know when they get there, if there's a Jewish community there, whether they're Jewish or not, but they know if there is a Jewish community there, they'll have something to eat, even if they didn't make enough money and they won't be able to buy the food when they get there, right? So the tamchui is for aniyeh olam, the poor of the world. And the kupa is collected once a week for more general needs, food, as well as other things for the people who are living there. Now, what happens if you didn't collect enough in the tamchui? Suddenly, there's a whole lot of people turned up. Migrants, peddlers, do I know? Or, and you just don't have enough, but you have money in the kupa that you collected on Friday still left. 
which was going to give in by people understanding that it was going for the people in the town, right? Or the reverse. Can you, as the people who are in charge, move it around, switch it and say, well, uh, we've got some money, we'll use that. Or maybe the person who gave that money, maybe gave beyond what you asked him, and he's given money because he cares about the poor of the town. And he doesn't want to give to a whole lot of people flooding the, the town, thank you very much. He wanted to give only to the people who live here. Or vice versa. Maybe he only wanted to give for food. And he didn't want it to be used in the kupa for something. Maybe you had leftover from the tamhui, and you wanted to sell the leftover food, which they used to do, and then use the money to buy, I don't know, some more towels for somebody or, or blankets or something, right? Can you do that? And what does it say? Rasha'im b'nei ha'ir la'asot kupa tamhui v'tamhui kupa. They can turn the tamhui which was basic survival for everybody in the world towards the kupa, and they can use the kupa for the tamchui. In other words, you can't, as a member of the town, say, I'm happy to give tzedakah, but don't you go use my tzedakah for those people. I meant it only for these people. You don't have that much right over your tzedakah. And the town has to take more care of people who are resident, but it has to make sure nobody's walking the streets with no place to sleep that night and nobody's walking the streets hungry um, if they got to your town. This is not so easy. I mean, I grew up in Manhattan and we didn't keep that. Yes, when I was growing up and I understand it's again a problem because of uh, Corona, there were a lot of homeless on the street. And uh, very often it's not only a problem of money, it's a problem of mental health, I know. Um, but Chazal talk about those issues as well, right? About how do you help somebody who it's hard to help the person. They, they, all that gets discussed. We're not going to do it now, but they, it gets discussed. So what we have here is um, something which is telling the person, we've moved it now from the poor are going to go from, from field to field and collect the food, or on the Shemitah year, they're going to be able to roam from place to place taking the food. We've moved it to a situation where we have to have money available. We're in a more urbanized society, and there has to be food and, and clothing and things like that and money available for people both who live here and for people passing through. We're turning up. Yes, I don't know how they did this. This is not easy. But you do see people writing about this through the Middle Ages. That's how it was that that the community did it. And they did sometimes suddenly have to go and look for more money. And they talk about these problems and they talk about people who not, don't want to pay and about having the, the authority um, to make it happen. Um, so it, it's, uh, um, now one would hope that today there's a bigger government effort to cover these things, a broader government effort rather than each town, but it doesn't always happen. And it's, it's very interesting to see that sometimes one has to turn to these kind of things and say, are we sure that this basic thing isn't, isn't going on? But what I'm focusing on here from a, a radical perspective is the fact that the person giving the charity does not necessarily able to say, I wanted it only for my friends who live here. He can't do that. Uh, he doesn't have control because the people taking care of things have to be have the freedom to see where the biggest need is. And you might have had in mind, I was just taking care of the people I know who live down this street. But in actual fact, you might end up taking care of somebody you never saw and will never see again uh, who's passing through. And um, there has to be the power for that to happen. Now I want to um, say, uh, okay, how this sort of migrated all this to Baba Batra from Pea, we've migrated from uh, Zraim, which was all about seeds, which is all about Shemitah and Pea and things like that. We've migrated to Baba Batra, which is about people's, where they're living, how they're living. Uh, you know, there was a wall between us and it fell down and who's got to fix it? Questions like that. But how did we get to Tzedakah within it? And here I want to focus on um, 
the, 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 the Mishnah where the turning point comes. Okay, so we're in Baba Batra. We're talking about a wall fell down and whose responsibility is it? Mine or yours to put it up again? And should it be on my side or on your side because it takes up space? Or are we talking about a courtyard that we share? And I said, I want more privacy. Do I have a right to say to you, I'm putting something in the middle of it and too bad. We used to use the whole courtyard together. Now you've got half and I've got half and how big the courtyard has to be minimally. We're talking about all those kind of things, which is about how neighbors hopefully manage to live together. And here we are in the Mishnah number four. Source number four. Kofin oto livnot by Chavadelet. What can I insist on your paying for as well? I live in an apartment building and one person there says, I want the downstairs repainted. And another person says, what I want most is a doormat. And the other person says, no, I want an elevator man. When I grew up, there was an elevator man. Then one day, the young people said, we don't want an elevator man. We want an automated elevator and we want a doorman. And I remember the older people saying, we don't want a doorman. We want an elevator man. Back and forth. Right? What do I have a right to say? This is what we should have. Where do we have a right as the majority to say uh, the the individual will have to pay towards this, even if he didn't want it, he didn't think it was necessary, because we as the majority think it is necessary. Or are there things even which are so basic that if only one person pipes up and says, hey, but this isn't safe, there's a there's a broken, uh, the door is broken, and people can hurt themselves, there's broken glass and whatever, I insist that somebody, we pay for somebody to come in and fix this, maybe one person can say. It was only one person who had the idea, but it's so correct that I can insist on it. So here it says, Kofinoto Livnot Bechar Vadelet Lachase. So the Mishnah says, we can insist. It's, it's obvious to the mission that certain things we can insist on. If that's something dangerous, of course, we can insist on everybody paying towards fixing it. We can insist that people pay in order to build a, a sort of, well, it's not true, but like a little guard, guard, uh, like, and this is what we have it a lot because very often there has to be somebody who sits at a, uh, to watch who's for security. So you have a little guard box or how would you call it? I don't know in, in English. What did you say? Ruth, have you got an idea for how to, what to call this little? Well, you have it right there in the translation, a gate. Oh, right. What yeah. does it say? Gatehouse. Okay, yeah. a gatehouse. All right. And a door to the jointly owned courtyard. They used to have jointly owned courtyards and a lot went on in the courtyard. They cooked in the courtyard. Their ovens were in the courtyard. Uh, you have your own recipe that nobody knows. Everybody can see you doing it because the ovens in the courtyard. Right. So they, uh, what do they say here? That um, they can insist that everybody pays towards this gatehouse and a door to the gate. And Rabban Shimon Gamaliel says, it depends. Not all courthouse, courtyards need a gatehouse. Okay, now why do we want a gatehouse? This is very complicated. Why did they have gatehouses? Is it for somebody to stay to, to, to stay in, to watch all the time, to let people in and out? Is it so that people can't see directly into, is the gatehouse something for somebody to sit in, who's watching for what? Is it for, is it a sort of extra something to give you a little more privacy? Somebody's got to walk through and maybe there's a door so that people can't see in. Is it to lock it? Right, And there were different kinds of gatehouses in those terms, those that were outside the courtyard, those that were inside, those that had one of these, how they used to lock their doors with it's like a padlock that went right across. Right, So there's all kinds of suggestions what kind of gatehouse this is. But the suggestion is that if it's a courtyard that needs a gatehouse, whether because for privacy it's on a main road or it's a big enough or whatever reason, then yes, we can insist that everybody contributes to this gatehouse. And the gatehouse is useful, maybe for safety, maybe for privacy. Okay, mostly seems to be about privacy. Okay, and then we say, yes, we also have the idea that we can insist that everybody pay, pays towards building a wall around the town, right? Think Rome, think medieval towns. Yes, you can have it for safety, a wall, and they close the gate at night. Yes, it's for safety. We can insist that everybody pays for this, right? Okay. And then we have a discussion. How long does somebody have to be in a city to be obliged to pay? And the answer is 
12 months, unless he buys a home there, in which case it's immediately. But if he's just renting or he's trying to staying with relatives or whatever. things. However, for the tamchui, he has to pay right away. Later in the Gemara, they say, that's not for tzedakah. Tzedakah, you've got to pay right away. But for um, uh, for other things, uh, or some kinds of tzedakah only after 30 days, all different things. But for, for paying towards building the wall. Okay, so we're in a town, and we're talking about getting along with each other and doing the things together that need to be done and insisting that everybody gives a hand and pays towards making sure that we have security, privacy, all the things we need in a town. And it all sounds wonderful or good. Maybe not wonderful, but good, solid, right? And then we get, Elia, in this case, Elia Hanavi coming and undermining it, okay? Before we had the laws of Shemitah, right now it's going to be Elia Hanavi who undermines it. And the Gemara, so I'm in source four where it says, Gimel men the Gemara, Lemeima, the Beit Shah, Mal Yutahi. This must mean that having a gatehouse is beneficial because if it wasn't beneficial, then what? I can't hear you. I can see though. Yes, Ruth, you want to unmute yourself? If it's not, if it's not necessary, then you can't compel everybody to, to join. Excellent. Them. Excellent. Excellent. It's not if it's not necessary, or maybe even later there's a discussion, maybe things that are not 100 percent necessary, but they're the the usual custom. I remember there was a discussion with an apartment building here that wanted to put in a mirror downstairs. Is a mirror downstairs as you walk in, a sort of thing that people didn't want to pay for it. Yes, that, that's kind of the custom, or that's in New York, but we're in Jerusalem, we don't need a mirror in our, in our going in, we'd like to spend the money some other way. Okay, so, so or not spend it at all. So, so it must be that a gatehouse is something good. It's beneficial. Why? Because otherwise we can't make people pay for it. It's only things that we really need that, or that whatever reason are the custom that we can make people pay for. So that's what I'm, I assume, says the Gemara. But, in the time of Chazad, they also had people they called Chasidim a little bit. They tended to be people who were especially um, good about Ben Adam Lechabeva, especially kind, carefully uh, sort of people. And they were called Chasidim. There was this chassid. The English put here a pious man, but pious could mean in many different ways. And a chassid was pious in a particular way, usually, which was a sort of kindness and gentleness. That Elijah, Elijah was accustomed to speak with him. And he built a gatehouse or paid towards Avad Bechar, he built a gatehouse or paid towards it. The two lo mishtai bahade. And Elijah didn't come anymore. Why not? Well, he couldn't get in, could he? Because what happens when you have a gatehouse? It gives you privacy. But if there's a door, yes, it means not everybody can look in, but also not everybody can just walk in and trespass. Well, that's good because I don't want trespasses. And we, we said we want our apartment building to be just for us and safe in the evening, yes? So we want it to be locked. And, and if there's no doorman, it's la vie, right? People will have to press on a button, forget whoever one of us. And if they can't find somebody, God forbid, somebody can get raped outside because we want our apartment building to be private and safe for us or our complex, right? Or our gated complex or whatever it is. So this Beit Shah was great for us, for the insiders, but it created outsiders, right? And it's not so great for the poor person because maybe he comes and I'm not in my chaser and a part of my chaser where I could easily hear him and he's shouting and he can't get in and he's shouting and I can't hear it because of this. So we suddenly have the Gemara flipping it off. 
here we were happily chugging along in the Mishnah, talking about how are we going to get along, you know? Is it my piece of the courtyard? Is it your piece of the courtyard? How, what can I make you agree with me about that we have to fix in this courtyard? And we're managing and we're being decent people and we're de- doing fine as a, as a sort of community. And then suddenly Elijah stops coming. Why? Because we were thinking very well about community, but only about each other in that community. And in the process of one of the changes that we made, which looked to us like a great change of putting this gatehouse, which gave us more privacy, more security, more this, more that, we actually kept the poor out, made it harder for the poor to get hurt. And there might be a poor person who's shouting there and we don't get to hear him because of that gatehouse. Um, And so Elijah, I guess, I mean, the, the, the Gemara's playing a little. Yes, Elijah can't get in either. Of course, Elijah doesn't have to come through a gatehouse and whatever it means for Elijah to turn up and chat with this um, chassid. But the, he doesn't come and sit around with the chassid anymore because there's a gatehouse. And he says, I can't get in either. And then the Gemara goes on to say, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe there are different kinds of gatehouses. Maybe one was built, maybe when it's built outside or it's built inside. And then there's a whole discussion, which one is the good one? Is the outside the problem? Because then he can't even get it towards the gate or is the inside one the problem because it's closed and he can't get in further and is maybe there's a gatehouse with or without a door and maybe there's a gatehouse with or without a lock and maybe there's a gatehouse with or without a padlock but it depends if it's open if you can open it from outside and it goes on and on in the Gemara saying maybe the different kinds of gatehouses we can solve this this was the wrong kind of gatehouse and that is one way to solve it and say well it depends then what we've said is in the process of doing things for our community as we define it in its narrow sense, watch out all the time that you're still thinking of the path of the person outside your narrow base. In other words, when you build that door, and it's a real problem, I know it's, it's a problem in modern society where, God forbid, somebody needs help and they can't get into our apartment complexes, right? Because they don't know anybody. And, and these are real problems. What do we do for our security versus the security of others, for our privacy versus the needs of others? So the Gemara manages to solve it by saying, there, maybe there's different ways that you can build the gatehouse that could be more or less accessible to the poor person. But the problem really does remain, which is how do you cater for your own community and still be open to others? How do you create the kind of community you want and still let others in who are different and who are going to be destructive to the kind of community you want. You won't have that privacy, or, or you might have the trespassing. This is, in other words, the Gemara is acknowledging there's a real problem here. It isn't straightforward. There is a problem. In, that There is a problem to create community. If you had Yovel functioning and you suddenly would have a situation where every 50 years, every, just complete societal upheaval, it would be mad. Just thinking about it gives me upheaval in my head. But we have to hold on to that, yes? Because in theory, we should have space for that when we think about society. So here's an example, and they use Elijah. And I want to show you another two places where Elijah stops talking to people. Right. And these are the only the other two cases I found with exactly this expression that he used to be hang around talking to these people and he stops. There are lots of different stories about Elijah, but this kind of language appears here and in one other place. And that's uh, source number five. And lo and behold, it's not such a different case. Avua bar ihi minyamin. It's an interesting name. We have today binyamin and we have Nehomish binyamin, but here we have minyamin bar ihi. They both of them were well off and they had, the English here is a waiter, but I don't think, I think it's more like a butler that people they used to have. It was somebody, a shamus, a shamus, somebody who brought the food, but it wasn't just, it's not like a waiter in a, in a, in a, um, a restaurant, right? It's, it's um, I don't know what, it's not the best word here, um, waiter for this. And one of them would give him the person who was serving from every type of food that he ate, mikol mina umina, he'd give him some, he'd give him, give him to eat, and what would he give him? A bit of everything, 
what well, he got four, four courses. The shamus also got four courses. The person serving also got the same as he ate. Vachad, something had me, and the other one gave him one of the things to eat. Uh, the guy wasn't hungry. It was okay, right? Uh, he's got a four course meal. He doesn't have to start giving the guy all the different courses. He doesn't have to have the hors d'oeuvre and the main course and this side dish and the dessert. He just give him some supper. That's all he needs. That's all he wants, right? So one gave from each thing, and he made sure that he had some of this and some of that and some of that. The other gave him supper, but didn't worry about his getting exactly the same, about his feeling I'm really a member of the family or whatever. And surprise, surprise, Mar Mishtai Eliyahu Bahade, Umar Lo Mishtai Eliyahu Bahade, one, the one who didn't share every different thing, um, uh, Elite Elijah didn't speak, didn't just spend time talking with him. And the one who gave from everything, made sure that he gave him from everything, i.e. created an equality of status, Elijah came to speak with him. It's almost as if, if you're equal to that fellow, then Elijah can come and say, well, I'll be equal to you because Elijah's not, and you are not really equal. He can forgive the distance if you can forgive the distance. But if you can't forgive the distance between yourself, if you see a difference between yourself and the person serving you, then Elijah sees a big difference. And why should he come and chat with you? Who are you? Similarly, the Gemara Tate tells an instance of two pious men, and there's some people say it was Rav Mari and Rav Pinchas, B'nai Rav Chista. One of them served the person who was serving them first, gave him supper to eat first or lunch, whatever it was, made sure that he first sat down and ate and then served. And the other one gave it to him after. Again, nothing wrong with saying, well, let's get dinner organized. What, I have to get it so organized? Why should I have my food cold or not perfectly straight off the pot? No, when the food is perfect, Tell the guy to go sit down, eat, the, eat the, his dinner, and then when he's finished, he'll come and serve you. Right? At which point the food is not as fresh, not as hot, not as perfect. Right? So one, it's almost like in, in one, the, the, he equalized the person serving, and the other one put the person serving before him. Yes, he got to eat first and then serve. And guess where, of course, and the other one gave him after, and of course, who did Elijah come and spend time talking with? It's obvious. The person who served the person first. Okay? So we see that the three stories that we have about Elijah's chatting with people. We have other stories about his visit, but the stories where it says these particular phrases are three stories in which the question is, where are you in terms of the poor person? The other. Yes? in terms of status, in terms of inside and outsider. If you can be with him, then Elijah can be with you. But if you can't be with him, then how on earth can you hope that Elijah will be with you? Um, and with that, I actually want to return to the verses about um, Yovel, the Jubilee. Because, and that's and number six, I brought them with their translations. Um, in the discussion of the Jubilee year and of the fact that people will go back to their ancestral homes, the problem crops up, but, but I bought that land. And the answer is that when you originally buy the land, you should be buying it not according to, not with the idea that you ever bought the land. It so reminds me of what I learned in school as a kid about how we, you know, we thought we bought Manhattan Island, but the people who sold it to us had no idea they were selling land. That's impossible, yes. It belongs to the great being or whoever they call it, uh, that tribe called, I don't remember. The, the, the idea that they were selling the land was absurd. It was silly. You can't sell it. The trees and the ground and the, and, and, and the forests and the, and, and, and the lakes, how could you sell them? That's absurd. You can't own them and you can't sell them. So when you're buying land, all you're doing is buying the crops, the number of years of crops that you could you can buy. And in the process of talking about that, there's a phrase which appears only here and in another place about treatment of the stranger or the slave who becomes free. Below, and it appears twice here, when you buy or sell, 
the word is so rare that we don't actually know what it means. It's not a no with an I in, which means to make suffer. It means the English put wrong. Well, it's no more wrong or right than any other word you would have put. It means don't wrong. Maybe it means to take advantage of another, to, to hurt another in their weak spot. Maybe it means to be dishonest in the way you're treating the other. Here it means, in any rate, it says, when you are buying or selling, do not wrong each other. Buy it exactly according to the number of, of um, crops that they will harvest that you'll have. Now, maybe it's here because when somebody got to the point where they would sell their home and their land, they were at the bottom and that people could take advantage, right? They could take advantage and buy it for less because... They, maybe that's why it's here. And it goes on and then it repeats it. The low tanu ish et amito, and do not wrong one the other. And this word lohonot appears here and appears on the stranger and appears on a slave who flees to Israel and becomes free as a result of that and is living with you in all those cases. Now, what exactly is this lotanu? And what is it doing being repeated? Right? We had it at the beginning, and then we have again the lotanu ishatamita. So Chazal understand that the laws of Ona'a include, in the monetary sense, overcharging or underpaying by more than a sixth. And that's how they understand it. And the question is today, how does that apply? Does it apply with that exact measurement or with others? But the idea is to really overcharge an unsuspecting person, or to really underpay an unsuspecting uh, seller, okay? To overcharge an unsuspecting buyer, or to undercharge, underpay an unsuspecting seller, like somebody has some antique in their home, and they have no idea, or they find a painting, and it's a Picasso, and you know, and you buy it for $5. That is a problem. Now, you might think that was a great idea, and you made a lot of money and it was terrific. But in actual fact, halacha thinks that is a problem because the person did not know what they were selling. So that's called ona'a, when you have knowledge and you take advantage of somebody as a result of that knowledge. And then this, it's repeated. And again, this is very interesting because capitalism, you know, one of the great ways to make money in capitalism is because you have more knowledge than somebody else. So when can you use that knowledge and when can you not take advantage of somebody will become a big question today. But the verse gets repeated below tanu ishatamito. And at that point, Chazal say, ah, ona'a is not only about monetary um, taking advantage, it's something else as well. And here's the Mishnah from Baba Metziah. Kishem she'ona'a b'mekach u'memka. Like there is ona'a, wronging, exploitation. Suddenly now the English changed from the word wrong to the word exploitation. Very different word, yes? A more specific, what's wrong? Because the word to wrong somebody could mean anything. Kach ona'a b'dvarim. So there is ona'a, verbal mistreatment in speech. Okay? Don't drive the guy crazy. How much is this? And what about for this? And what about that? When you don't intend to buy it. Now we're talking about a shuk. We're not talking about a department store, which has got the, the, the amounts written down. We're talking about in the shuk. Oh, how much do you want for that? Oh, no, no, I really want less. What about you sit there and bargain for half an hour and then you walk off? Okay, you're not allowed to do that. Because you change the price, you waste his time, you change the price of the article, you change the value in people's eyes around, like if you bargain them down to almost nothing, and then people come. So we're dealing in a, in a situation where the, the, there's no clear value to the article, and you're, um, you're, you're sitting there and fighting over how much it's going to cost. But look at the other examples in the Mishnah. Ima ya baal tshuva, lo yomalo tzhor ma'asecha havishamim. If the person was a Baal Tshuva, don't say to him, remember your previous way you used to behave. Don't, don't point out to him, oh, I remember though when you were really awful. Now this might be somebody who's a Baal Tshuva in the sense that they used to be a thief. Or it, mean, it might mean somebody like we use it today, a Baal Tshuva who wasn't religious and now became religious. Whatever it is, 
don't go and say to him, I actually remember what you were like. I remember you did this and this. And um, if he's a gear, if he's a convert, don't, or the son of a convert here, don't say to him, oh, but remember, we know what your parents, they used to do. Remember people were pagans, right? So they were converting from a very different world where and they, they were pagans. Now, the Gemara quotes other sources which give other examples. Like for instance, if he himself was a convert, don't say to him, oh, the mouth that ate all kinds of non-kosher animals now wants to say Torah? What do you think? You think that mouth that used to eat those things can say Torah now? That's a, I'm, I'm reading some more from the Talmud, quoting other contemporary sources talking about this. And they even have the idea that if somebody's suffering and Tzorah's come, don't say to him, oh, it must be because you did something wrong. In all these cases, you're hitting somebody who's down, but, uh, or who's sensitive. Most of the cases are about somebody who something changed very drastically. Right, the the person converted, their parent converted, they they did tshuva, they suddenly suffered, and you have to allow for change, allow for the person to be in new place. There's no point giving lots of laws about things can happen, they can be social upheaval. You have to make space for the migrant to come and move in. If you not know, then how can you treat those people once they're here? And the answer is very interesting that it comes from the laws of your veil. When it's talking about this, it kind of just pops out of here that from these verses, which are talking about actually buying a piece of land fairly, you could just use the word fair. Yes, don't deal unfairly. They say, no, it's not only about buying land unfairly. These verses about Yovel have come to tell us something else as well, which is if somebody has changed from where they were before, we're talking about people who are so poor, they're selling their land. If somebody's moved on, if somebody now has converted, if somebody's done tshuva, don't say to him, but you're not really this new person who's doing these things. You're really this down and outer who used to do those things, or those are the kind of parents that you had, or who do you think you are to be a, a teacher of Torah or something like that? Because that is a corollary of what's there before. If you don't do that, then having all these rules about helping them and giving them the food, it's not going to work. It has to come together with how you're going to treat them from a verbal point of view as well. So they understand lo tanu ishet amito means and verbally keep going. Don't only do the physical things and give out the, to the charity and all and allow them to come live near you. But when they've come to live near you, don't turn around and say, but look who you are. We let you come move here last week, last, you know, five years ago, and you were nothing before that. You weren't even making a living. You can't do that. Lo tanu ishan, you carry it through in terms of how you speak afterwards. And it ends with, v'yareta me'elokecha, have fear of God, awe of God, k'ani Hashem elokechem. V'yareta me'elokecha, have a sense of yareta lokem, which isn't necessarily what we call fear a sense of presence of God, have a sense that there's a God. Like all through the book of Bereshit, it never says about love of God. It's all about you. Have that sense of a reality of God. I am your, but in English, we don't have a difference in you're in the singular and the plural, plural, but it's very important. I am the your God, meaning the God of all of you, of that person who moved Yes, whether it was place, station, way of being, that person who's moved into your orbit and of you. I am the God of both of you. Have a sense of presence of God because I am the God of all of you. Um, so we've come full circle to the way they hear the verses about the Jubilee year, which I would not have necessarily noticed if it wouldn't have been then telling me there was this word lotanu and then again the word lotanu and they've come full circle to say it's about trying to do the right thing and then about really trying to live that right thing in speech and in perspective so I, I i really i hope for all of us that we can make something of this shemitah year in the sense of of taking some of the ideas and seeing where we can 
uh, where we can go with them. And I want to add a couple of minutes because I don't know if there's anybody who wants to throw in an idea of where they might take any of this. Or is it too much, too quick? Does anybody want to say anything? Okay, so it's over to you, Evie. Okay, feel free to unmute right now if you'd like to say something. Um, so nice to have everyone. Um, and thank you so much, um, Ravanit Gila, for this very interesting uh, series. I'm sure everybody's digesting. Um, and thank you again to everyone who joined us here today, not only here in Zoom, but also on um, uh, Facebook and on Drisha Live. Uh, we will be um, together again tomorrow at uh, 7 30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll have the final class in another series, uh, The Snake in the Garden with Rabbi Silber. Uh, you can always find out uh, information about classes, uh, class offerings, and registration links on our website at www.drisha.org slash classes. You can also watch classes live on the website um, uh, www.drisha.org slash live. Uh, thank you again for this wonderful series and the opportunity to learn with you, uh, Rabbanit Gila. And thanks again to everyone who attended. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, at one of our upcoming classes here at Risha. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. Thank Leitraut. you. Leitraut. Leitraut.